Hey everyone, welcome back to Dan's Chess Lounge. Today I have a great game that I'm going to present to you all. It's with Alexander Belyavsky versus Dr. John Nunn. Now Nunn is known as an extreme tactically uh, gifted person. Uh, he's a mathematician and he's an extreme calculator. Uh, so it's usually fireworks when he plays. And Belyavsky, he used to be Kasparov's coach at one point in time. Uh, he's a FIDE trainer, and uh, he's he's known for being one of the oldest players that was still playing at a very high level. At one point, he was the oldest player that was still in the top 100 uh, ranked players in the world. So he's a formidable opponent. He's uh, very aggressive, and he's a tactician as well. So it should be fireworks on the board, uh, taken from Alexei Shirov's book, <laughs> Fire on the Board. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into the game and see what happened. You have d4, knight f6, c4, g6. We're going to have a king's indian type of position here. Knight c3, bishop g7, e4. Now white has a big center here. Uh, if black doesn't uh, counter counteract what's going on here, he could get just rolled right over, especially with e5 coming on the next move here. So you have d6. We have a king's Indian defense going on right here. Great opening. Uh, one of Kasparov's uh, uh, mainstays when he used to play competitively. Hikaru Nakamura is one of the greatest king's Indian defense players in the world right now. Uh, Timur Rajabov, he's a great king's Indian defense player. Let's see here. So now you have F3. Uh, this signals the sameish variation. White's idea here is to play Bishop E3, followed by Queen D2, and then uh, even push on the king side with G4, G5, H4. So basically, uh, White's idea here is to counteract Black's idea of pushing on the king side. Usually white will castle queenside uh, in this variation. You have kingside castle for black. Bishop e3 uh, going along with the same plan that we just talked about for white. Now you have black played knight b d7 here, which is the fifth most popular move. It's, it's by far not the main, main line here. What's more popular is to play either c5 here. Uh, with expansion on the queen side, play it that way, or you can even play e5 here, uh, going along with the typical breaks that you would see in the King's Indian defense after white would play like d5 here, then you would have maybe knight h5 followed up by f5 and f4, things like that. But instead, uh, none played knight bd7 here. Uh, with the ideas of maybe striking with either e5 or c5 uh, in the near future and having the knight be able to support that push. So you have queen d2 that was played in the game. Um, knight h3 here. The annotator of this game, Yasser Serwan, he liked uh, knight going to h3 better here because he felt like since black played a slower move with the knight b to d7, then now white can play knight to h3 followed up by knight to f2. Because one of the problems with the sameish opening for white is that white has a hard time developing that g1 bishop. I mean, excuse me, the g1 knight. Uh, he doesn't really know where that knight is going to go. So since none use kind of like a, a more slower move with the knight b d d7 Seron felt like now white can go, could have went ahead and put that knight on h3 followed up to f2 but Belyovsky didn't play that way he decided to play queen d2 going along with the battery plan of, of sending the bishop to h6 trying to swap off dark square bishops and then castling also queenside. That's that was Belyovsky's 
idea and plan here. So then none strikes in the center with c5. Now you have the push here, d5. So now white is trying to squeeze black and cramp black uh, because white has so much space. Look at white's big center there. And then black is a little bit uh, cramped here, less space. So that's the idea of d5 here. Now this is a great move here. Good, a good attacking move. Knight to e5 here. So if you look at the board, white is having a problem with development. He has not developed his any of his pieces on the king side. The rook, knight, and bishop is still undeveloped. And so none plays knight to e5 because now if white wants to kick the knight, the knight's going to go to g4. And then that's going to harass the bishop there on e3. You know, it's going to it's going to cause major issues in White's development. So White plays h3, which will stop the knight from going to g4 once he kicks it with the f3 move. But the downside to that though is that it weakens the g3 square. So now that square is going is very uh very tempting for a knight to hop into that square there. And Immediately, none starts to go right for that square. He plays knight to h5 here, eyeing that g3 square. So now you have bishop f2, which defends that square. f5. Now, black wants to open up the position. General principles right here. Good chess fundamentals right here. If you're ahead in development, you want to open up the position. So now you have e takes f. And now the rook takes here. Rook takes F. Now, you guys notice something here? This square right here, it's real tempting and meaty and juicy for a fork going on. If he plays G4 here, that's going to fork the knight and the rook here. But the thing about it is, the thing about that move, Rook takes F5, that's a brilliant move there. And that's that. none played that move in order to keep the knight from being pushed off of e5 because now Belyovsky cannot play f4. If he plays f4, then the pawn just gets taken. So that was a great move to keep the knight in a very active outpost there. So he accepts the sacrifice. He goes ahead and plays g4. He says, show me what you got. And now you have rook takes f3 saying, I'm just going to keep pushing forward. So, and what that does, that also, that eliminates that pawn for, so now the knight on e5 can never be moved unless it's from another piece. It cannot be harassed by any pawns. Now in the game, g takes h was played. So he accepted the sacrifice, he took the knight on the h file here. But there are several different continuations. Let me go through some of them here to show you what would happen. Like if he played knight takes the rook there, then that would immediately fall victim to a fork where the knight forks the, the king and queen. So he couldn't do that. If he castled, now you would have, with the idea of now trying to take the rook, now you would have the rook just dropping back to f7. Then he accepts the sacrifice, the sacrifice knight on the h5. But then after that, he would be in a world of hurt because now you have the queen going to f8, attacking the bishop there on f2, but also threatening to play bishop h6, which will pin the queen on d2. So he has a dual threats here, multiple threats going on here. You would have rook h2. The bishop goes to h6, like we were just saying. The bishop blocks, bishop e3. Bishop takes, queen takes. Now you have rook takes, bishop on f1. And at the end of this variation, black is up a pawn, and he has a much more active position here. This is better for black. So if we go back, let me show you another option that could happen here. If he played bishop g2, then you would have knight d3, check, and that would just win 
the bishop there on f2. And then finally, if he played bishop e2, uh, still controlling that d3 square where the knight can hop to d3, then you would have rook just kills the bishop on f2. Rook takes f2. King takes queen f f8. Knight blocks that, but then you would have knight f4. And at the end of this variation, black has a definite compensation for the exchange piece due to, to white's king being exposed uh, almost in the middle of the board. And white is weak on the dark squares, so that would not be a good continuation for white. So going back, that that is the reason why white played. g takes h5 we just immediately accepted uh, the sacrifice knight on the h file so then you have queen f8 here and that's threatening the bishop going to h6 which would control that h6 to c1 diagonal that would stop white from being able to castle and black's king is majorly exposed and then also, this is all home preparation. I want to point out that John Nunn prepared all this before the game, and he went through the sacrifice and all the different continuations that could happen, and he felt like this is a lot better for Black. So this is all home prep here. He was very comfortable playing this game and being in these positions. Belyovsky was seeing all this stuff for the very first time, uh, no, no doubt. No doubt that this was the first time we were seeing this stuff. Knight e4. This move here, the engine didn't like, but it's logical. It makes a lot of sense uh, for a human being to play that move. Because uh, the idea here is that now, um, Belly obviously can play knight to g5 and then reinforce the knight with h4, and then he can castle. So, because, you know, the problem is White's king is exposed in the center. He can't castle because you always have the threat of bishop to h6 forking, I mean, yeah, forking the king and queen and pinning the, pinning the queen to the king there. So, that's why knight e4 seems like a very logical move there. Bishop h6 was played. Queen goes to c2. This is a little bit of a mistake here. Now you have queen going to f4, which which is gives black the opportunity to attack the knight on e4. If uh, if he plays bishop to f5, then you're going to have two of black's pieces on the on the knight there at e4. Knight e2 was played in the game. Um Belyowski decided that taking the rook is not the best move here because that might lead to a a losing end game. Let me show you what would happen here. Knight takes rook, and then after that, there's going to be a lot of exchanges going on. Knight takes knight, check. King moves over. Now you have the bishop going to f5, pinning the the queen to the knight. Bishop g3 attacks black's queen. Now you have queen going to e3, still still attacking this knight here on e4. That's pinned to the queen. The bishop goes back to f2. Now you have queen takes the knight. Queen takes queen. Bishop takes. Bishop g2 attacks the knight on f3. Rook f8. Now at the end of this line here, black is slightly better due to having more active pieces. If you look at the board, I've highlighted all of Black's pieces in green, where you can see they're all involved in the fight here. They're all involved in the battle. Look at White's two ricks there. They haven't moved. They're in the same squares that they started on. They're just uh, protecting pawns on H3 and on A2. So this is much better for, this is slightly better for Black. Uh, he's going to a lot easier position for him to play. So Belyowski realized that, and he didn't want to continue that way. So let's go back here to the game. 
So instead, he played knight e2 here. Now you have rook takes f2. This is clearing the way for black to play knight f3 check. Knight takes f2 is played in the game. If knight takes f4 was played, taking the queen, then you would have rook takes queen on c2. And then this is much better for black. For the same reason that we mentioned before, just black's pieces is just much more active. Uh, you have a rook on the second rank. They call that the clearing rank there, where, where black can just clean up and eat all the pawns uh, on the second rank and then just kind of limit uh, white's position. So this is better, much better for black here. So that's why knight takes queen wasn't played. Instead, knight takes f2, knight takes the rook. Now you have knight f3 check. King goes to d1, queen h4, hits the undefended knight that's on f2. Now, where does the knight go here? How is the knight defended in this position here? It's not that easy. You can have rook h2, which defends the knight, but then you would just have the knight that takes the rook. Knight takes rook there, loses it. Or you could have knight c3 which clears the way for the queen to protect the knight, but then you would have knight d4, which hits the queen. The queen doesn't have that many squares it can go to. Don't forget that bishop was on h6, uh, eyeing the dark squares there. So queen would go to e4, trying to uh, exchange the queens, but then you would just have queen takes knight. So that knight there is very hard to defend. So instead, in the game, knight d3 was played, just moved it, moved it to the d3 square. But what that does is that makes that e1 square very, very tender. If that knight ever moves, then you would have queen e1 checkmate. So you have bishop f5 going for uh, removing the defender tactic. So if we just so if he is able to capture that knight. Then he will play queen e1. Now also you have the knight threatening to go to e5, removing the defender. Or the knight can go to e1, which is a brutal move there. That attacks the queen and it attacks that knight on d3. That would just be brutal there. So white plays knight e to c1, which reinforces that d3 knight that covers that uh, it's critical e1 square knight d2 is a beautiful move how many how many times do you see a knight going your opponent's knight going to d2 it's not very often this is a great move the knight is so far behind enemy territory it, i mean so many threats here now this this here is a tricky move because it threatens to win the rook on h1 for example Let's just say that white played b4 here. Now you would have queen e4, which threatens the rook. So don't forget the rook is the only piece that's defending the bishop on f1. So it can't move to h2. It has to go to g1. Now you would have queen e3, which also threatens the rook again. And then also it's, it's eyeing, the knight's eyeing the bishop on f1. So then the rook would have to move. Now you, it would fall to queen f3, forking the, the king and the, and the rook there. So this is all due to the, and he takes the rook. He would take the rook. Now this is all threatened by this queen to h4 move here. So in the game here, h takes g was played trying for some uh, counter activity here. H takes G back. Now you have Bishop G2, which covers that E4 square that will lead to the loss of the, the Rook. Now Knight C4. See, this is, this is so bad for White because White's King is so exposed. I mean, he needed the castle sooner get castled in the game 
you know, it's amazing that even though we have GMs here, they still have to abide by the, the fundamentals and the principles. And this is a great example of what happens if they don't, if they break the rules and then your opponent can exploit the, the weaknesses. So now the, the C, the, the E3 square is eyed here for the beautiful fork that would fork the king and queen there. So the queen moves out of the way of that fork and then also tries to threaten the queen trade because white would love to trade queens here and try to get to an end game to where he might be able to, to win an end game here. But as we all know, if you have a brutal attack going, the last thing you want to do is trade your queen. So now you have knight e3, check. King goes to e2. Now the queen slides all the way to the queen side here, which is very, very uh, almost comical that the queen was doing so much damage on that king side. Then it just went all the way over to the other side. Like, okay, I'll get you from the other side now. Now the threat here is c2, which would win uh, the piece, the, one of the knights there on d3 there. Bishop f3. White says, hey man, you're going to win this this knight. I'm going to go ahead and give you this knight here if you choose. And he didn't. So none played rook to f8. So he wants to get all of his pieces into the game. And that, that uh, rook there indirectly pins the queen. If those bishops ever move, then the queen's going to be under attack by that rook. Going back one move, if queen c2 was played here, then you would have the king going to e1. Bishop takes the knight, and that would win a piece there. So he could have won a piece right then and there if he wanted to, but he wanted to get all of his pieces in the game. So that's why he played rook f8 right here instead. Now you have rook g1, which is uh, kind of like just a, a last minute prayer, trying to get some activity. Like if the bishop is traded, if that if that light square bishop on f5 is ever traded, then maybe white could crash down with uh, rook takes g6. But that's like a last ditch effort though. Now you have knight c2, which is just a beautiful, beautiful move here because it threatens the rook on a1. I mean, one of the knights is going to be taken. He's going to lose another piece here. Uh, he's going to lose two pieces here. The, rooks, the rook on a1 is going to fall, and then the knight is going to fall as well because the knight on d3 is pinned. So it's, he's going to lose multiple pieces at this point. You have King D1 getting trying to get out of the way of all the pins and all of the threats, but it, it's too late though. Now you have Bishop takes Knight here, and Belioski just resigned at this point because his position is just completely lost. It's just too many threats going on. The Rook on F8 is still pinning the Bishop to the Queen. The the Dark Square Bishop on A6 is hitting the the knight on c1 the knight on c2 is still threatening to take the rook on a1 it's just so many threats going on here so belly was like that's it i'm done so john nunn considered this to be his greatest game ever so this was the pinnacle of his of his career as he noted okay guys i hope you enjoyed the game today don't forget to like comment and subscribe and stay tuned for the next one.